what I see regularly happen with small to medium businesses is this, this religiosity, this commitment to how things were and saying, well, we always have said this, so we have to continue to say that. And, yeah. and uh, that, that relishing the celebration of history really burdens the contemporary application of your work. Okay. Um, you know? And so that's one of the things we see gets in the way with small to medium businesses. We've all heard the saying, diamond in the rough. Well, today's guest takes that saying one step further because I really feel like he is the ideal diamond in the actual diamond shop. Hi, I'm Joshua Carlson, co-founder of Propello Media. And in today's Ask an Expert, I'm gonna be sitting down with Sasha Strauss. He's the founder of a branding and strategist firm called Innovation Protocol, where they've worked with some of the biggest companies in the world, from Google, PayPal, to Nestle, just to name a few. But he's also a professor because he's big on education and fostering new developing ideas. Today, he's going to share some of those ideas from branding to how to create a great story to resonate with your customers or your market. He's also going to talk about the importance of video as well as empathy and how you should be applying that in your business today. Let's get started and hear what he has to say. Sasha, thank you for coming on our Ask an Expert segment today. My pleasure. So glad to be here. Okay, so you are a branding expert. You have a branding firm. Um, I'm curious, uh, <laughs> you're being modest, you are an expert. Um, so I'm curious what you guys have experienced as an organization these past few months as we've gone through this um, kind of unprecedented volatility. Yeah, it, unprecedented is the right answer. Uh, and to that end, we're, we're, we don't have a lot of uh, best practices to study or examples to follow. Everyone is figuring this out from the smallest to the largest, from the newest to the oldest. So right. it, is, it is an interesting time to be a strategist. Um, as far as our firm is concerned, um, we've just basically seen a client pivot in the sense that um, traditional branding programs, because you kind of need um, multiple leaders bought in for branding programs to work well, you need like not only the, the head of marketing, but you also need the head of ops and the head of talent and tech all to agree that branding is worth the time. Sure. Um, traditionally, you saw it very micromanaged in the sense that they were like, all right, hey, uh, every month, let's, let's have our tasks. Okay, we're checking those boxes. Um, we have actually seen that, that that no longer be the case. What we're actually seeing is organizations who really want like 12, 18 months worth of programming, really thinking about how they're going to get through this COVID crisis and get past this COVID crisis through a whole series of actions and behaviors. So it's just interesting because instead of writing, you know, proposals and contracts for projects, we're, we're writing pro proposals and contracts for programs. And um, that's fine. It works really well with our business planning, but it is absolutely required a whole sort of new lens on, on our relationships and, and our business development process. So from that standpoint, as far as this 12 to 18 month kind of roadmap of, you know, yeah. whatever it's going to be, what are some of the suggestions you have for businesses right now um, to reposition themselves from a, from a branding standpoint? Well, um, it's a dangerous time to rebrand. So I, I don't, we recommend that folks do not simply because any marketing effort right now that isn't invited feels unwarranted, feels out of place and a little creepy. Sure. So when you're doing a rebrand, you end up having to do lots of marketing just to get people to pay attention and know that you're coming back or whatever the case. So what we have been recommending is looking at the actions that were synonymous with your organization. Let's just say you traditionally had a gala dinner or you traditionally had a summit. All right. How can you take that initiative and make it into like three or four modules where over a period of a week or a period of time, you're creating some continuum of high value. So uh, let's say we have a client that like regularly uh, presents at a trade show, multi-million dollar investment, et cetera. And now they're really recognizing that the best thing to do is to have a three day, three hour a day summit where actually more people can come. <laughs> right. Right, which is such a fascinating gift from the problem. The problem is you can't have an event. Well, the gift is that you can have more people attend now and you can actually engage more stakeholders, more constituents, um, and, and also invite other parties to the table. So like having a panel, you know, the hardest part about having a panel was getting the panelists to the panel. Sure. And now 
everybody's a click away. So really interesting times. And so to answer your question, I'm sorry for the ex extended answer. The 12 to 18 month plan is, all right, what are we known for historically that won't exist again because we live in a new time? All right, how do we build 12 to 18 months of programming and runway so we know, oh, there's a cadence to our email newsletters. There's a cadence to our educational content. There's a, and that way that creates a little semblance of stability in a time without it. Okay, and so one of the things you touched on, and I think it's important to reiterate right now is, if it's uninvited, it's not welcome right now. Um, yeah. But it sounds like the caveat here is if there's value in what's being provided, I'm not selling, I'm serving kind of mentality, um, then you have a, you've got a great opportunity to, to have engagement. Yes, the, the, the invites to educate will, will be opened. But remember that we're also really upset when we're fooled. Right. So if you say, oh, we're going to have this event, it's going to be really educational. And what are you doing? You're using your, literally your sales decks from four months ago before COVID was a question. Right. Uh, that, that's not educational. Uh, to that end, um, now everybody knows that education is the marketing asset of the day. So I, I personally watched three to four webinars a week. I mean, I work really hard to, to calculate them into my calendar. And these are webinars from all kinds of organizations, from research institutions to government service organizations to, um, gosh, it's infinite. I really, the list goes on and on. And, and, and so you recognize that, oh gosh, everyone knows that marketing feels unwarranted right now. Education is invited. All right, teach, don't sell. All right, well, what are we going to teach on? one thing that we often bring to our clients is that you you used to fear teaching people what you do and how you do it because you thought you were giving away the secret sauce mm -hmm. the evidence i mean this is not my opinion this is literally what has is seen and known and understood is that when you teach someone when you teach an organization teach leaders to do your work they just better understand your work they also really appreciate how much you're lifting for example when you pay someone to paint your house and you don't watch, you have no idea how hard it was to paint that house. Sure. But when you actually are involved in the painting process, uh, you're actually quite inspired by the work. Okay, that's a good perspective. Um, so as we talk about branding, one of the things I think that there's a disconnect, um, especially in the SMB space, I um, mean, even with large corporations, but it is this disconnect between what we think our brand is and what our brand actually is. Could you just kind of talk about the dichotomy between those two spaces? Yeah, and I don't want, you know, SMBs are not necessarily at fault alone in this. Uh, great nonprofits and academic institutions and religions, from my work experience, have the same problem. So everyone give a little, little forgiveness there. One thing that is abundant amongst the smaller organizations is that a, usually a founder or originator or a longtime employee is still there. And there's a lot of, like, protecting sacred past novelties. A lot of like, well, we really always have done this thing. And, um, you know, the world not only functions differently, but sees things differently, sees business differently now. And so what I, what I see regularly happen with small to medium businesses is this, this religiosity, this commitment to how things were and saying, well, we always have said this, so we have to continue to say that. And, sure. and uh, that, that relishing the celebration of history really burdens the contemporary application of your work, okay. um, you know? And so that's one of the things we see gets in the way with the small and medium businesses. Okay, so to that point, I had a guest on, um, Howard Bihar, former president of Starbucks. Um, one of the things that he talked about um, is big on culture. Um, and so I wanna say what he said, and I'm gonna butcher it a little bit, but then have you applied to branding. Uh, basically said, uh, you may not like the culture you have, but it's the culture you deserve. Um, and basically the, the thought process here and that, you know, if you're not doing something to change it, then guess what folks, like you've earned where you're at. From a branding standpoint, I, I think this is a good piggyback because what you were just talking about is it sounds like brands and organizations need to evolve um, to, to where customers are or where the market is today. Yeah, a um, couple things come to mind here quickly. Um, one, culture is expensive. <laughs> we forget it. You know, you think that because it's all about the feels that it must be cheap to make, but it's like, you know, uh, really time consuming, lots of hand to hand combat, lots of mistakes and slaps. So culture's hard. 
and culture isn't one person's job. So you're, there is not such thing as a culture captain, even though that rhymes nicely. You know, it's just not such thing. There's only unified efforts of cultural enablement. <laughs> um, and so that's something that I think often organizations who want a culture forget. Okay. And then uh, the second thing that you have to think about, and I have a perfect example of a friend who runs a business, Part of the business is a retail business, mm -hmm. and part of the business is a distribution direct consumer business. Okay. And s since the founding of both, this leader has believed that the culture should be the same in the retail environment and in the warehouse right. direct to consumer. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting. I, I just talked to this leader a, a week ago, and the leader ba basically was like, you know, I'm not giving up. I've made a business decision. They're, they're not the same thing. The, the, the retail energy and, and time clocking in and like, oh, can you cover my lunch? That's like so different yeah. than like logistical planning for a multi-million dollar warehouse of resource. So what I am putting out there is that you might need to bifurcate culture just to meet the needs of the local behavior. And I only mean local in the sense of like people in this community or people in that platform. So for example, um, for the cultures that live in applications like Teams, Slack, any chat-based work dialogue, you've probably exp experienced this, like the days of writing an email, the culture of an email is very different than the culture of like typos, misspellings, elbow clicking send while I'm in a Zoom. Um, and that's okay, you know, but the point is, is that there may be a place for cult e email formality and there's a place for the sociality of the chat environment. And so when we ask ourselves, like, how do we build out that culture? I just don't want to pick one device and apply it to all formats of the leadership, all fam formats of the workforce, and all formats of the partnerships. Interesting. Um, so another concept on branding that I think about um, is organizational branding um, and individual branding. Um, can you talk about the difference between those? Is there is there a difference in how you approach that, or um, or are they the same? Oh gosh! So well, we part of the way that innovation protocol does its work is it always acknowledges to everyone it's servicing that this work is not only for the organization; it's for the individual. All the things that apply to branding an organization, a nonprofit, a religion, a corporation, that applies to an individual. The organization has competitors, the individual has competitors. The organization has an audience, the individual has, the organization has an audience, the individual has audiences. And so the rigor and analysis remains the same. Um, in fact, when we do personal brand coaching for CEOs or students, you know, they're often baffled. They're like, wow, uh, can I use this for my corporation too? And we're like, yeah. <laughs> All we've done is singularized the notion to you versus the institution. And, and so that's really kind of important to recognize. But what I think the root of your question might be, you know, it used to be that the, the leadership, the C-suite of an organization, at least a publicly facing organization, those people were really known for their uh, te technical specialty, their career history. And now it's like, so who shows best on Zoom? Who's really good at presenting on Zoom? You know, and it's interesting that there's now this like celebrity C-suite thing going on where your, your actual C-suite is about who, who's tweeting, you know, like, oh, our primary marketing channel is our leader. You know, um, one of my coworkers brings this up all the time that uh, Elon, Musk's, Elon Musk has more followers than SpaceX and Tesla combined and I know that he's kind of his own person, but right. why, don't, why don't those corporations have equivalent followers? Way more space fans than our Elon Musk fans. But the point is simply is that we really kind of like, we want to, we, we, we do connect to individuals with strong identities. And that's why on an organization level, it is very important and powerful uh, for the leaders to have one. Well, so I've seen some of your speeches before. You are a um, an eloquent storyteller, um, and I want to just talk about this because I think story is one of the best mediums to to engage brands and you know products and services. Um, how does an organization go about developing a good story? Um, not what is the story, but what is the process that they should go through um, to to build one? 
Okay. Well, um, <laughs> I guess here we go. Here, uh, let me. <laughs> I mean, so first, the, for, the first thing that's really important to recognize is that there are not infinite story structures. There are only like a handful. And not only are there only a handful of story structures, but there's of, of the three, <laughs> there's only like one that might be right for what you're trying to communicate. And what people forget is they try to make the story about the like pinnacle moment. That's the reason why the story happens. And that's not in fact the case. Um, what matters most is the experience of the story. So um, to answer your question, one mechanism is the story arc. And so here we have a, a very simple to use concept where you ladder up to some in inspiring concept, something that's interesting. You have to bring the challenges, the darkness, the truth, the limiting factors into yep. the discussion. And then you get to ramp up and say, all right, what are we going to do with this? And how are we going to get there? And what are the mechanisms to, to sur surmount these challenges and achieve these goals? Sure. And so this story arc pattern as a framework is a really great starting point. Now, one thing that you'll probably ask would be, all right, well, how do you populate the story? And What's so, awesome. yeah, so just like you and I do in our work every day, you ask a lot of questions and you collect the insights and then you use those insights um, in an organized fashion. So for example, here you and I are talking and learning from each other and I'm writing notes to myself about the things that you and I are talking about. Uh, every, every two weeks or so, I take those insights and I try and identify where they fall within a longer dialogue about what's going on in the world. Sure. So sure. that when I'm hosting a keynote or delivering a, a presentation to my graduate students, um, I have all the insights that I want to discuss, but mm -hmm. instead of discussing them in the order that I found them, yep. right, or the popularity this week on Twitter, I'm organizing them based on a construct that they will not be able to forget. And okay. so much of what you and I remember our whole lifetime was just because of the construct, not necessarily the peak story. Okay, so the, the board that you have on the background, um, is it finished or is this mid-process right now? Oh, well this, uh, both, both as, a, as a resource for me, you can see these are just little like yep. scrap little pieces little. of cork with, yep. that I put little uh, pins in. But for example, um, there's a keynote that I've delivered. Uh, it's, it's one of my most delivered keynotes uh, over the last five years called Rise of the Hero Gen. And it's about how um, certain technologies and certain lifestyle practices are basically deleting the boundary of what a generation was. Like for example, like people over 60 regularly post on Facebook. So social media isn't necessarily a youth device. I age, right. Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so all those sort of factors. So, rise of the hero gen. Well, part of my like, part of my way about bringing that content to 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 all of its audiences was I basically was like, look, I got a pile of data. The data is itself interesting, but it's hard to love data. So, yeah. what I've done, and I'm telling you as I'm delivering the speech, I have organized it in a pattern that you will be able to remember. And so, in that speech in Rise of the Hero Gen, while I'm talking to, let's say, the aerospace industry, or I'm talking biotech or whatever, I'm, I'm kind of using this pattern and it basically helps them give up. They're like, what's this presenter going to talk about next? Or what's the next slide? And they're like, sit back, observe the information in a pattern that they can recall. And so I think that's probably why that speech did so well or continues to do so well. Um, you know, you talk to any person who gives regular keynotes and to be able to, to use a piece of content you've developed like that thousands of times. Right. There's gotta be some, I mean, it's, trust me, I'm not that good. I'm not that good. I promise it, it has to be something about the method I'm using, you know? Well, I, yes, I think the method is very important, but I think the delivery of that method is, is somewhat important as well. And I think you, you were skillful from that standpoint, but as it pertains to the story, I have a two part question for this. How long did it take you to come up with that hero gen? Um, and how, um, if at all, do you modify it based upon the audience that you were speaking to? Okay. Uh, okay, great. So let me answer the first question about the timing on how long it took to build Rise of the Hero Gen. 
So what was the inciting incident? The inciting incident that I was sitting at my desk with my coworker, Anna, I get a call from our client at Google basically saying, we've got this groundbreaking set of new data that we used, you know, we studied 2 billion people worldwide. We were able to figure out that this is how people are acting, using, involving tech in and out of their lives for healthcare and other things. It's revolutionary. We compiled it and we presented it to a bunch of CEOs and uh, they all rejected it. And, you know, and I were like, what do you, what do you mean they rejected it? They're basically like, well, the CEO said, you're Google, you're smart. I suspect that you're going to bring groundbreaking data, but the problem is I don't know how to use what it is that you're giving me. Exactly. So they called us in a panic and they were basically like, hey, you did not keynotes at our conferences before, we've got this problem, can you act on it? So just to get to the answer to the question, four weeks later on stage, we delivered Rise of the Hero Gen to that core audience. And then for the next five years, we traveled the world presenting it at the largest Google summits they ever hosted uh, from Argentina to Japan to sure. all over Europe. And yeah, so it, it really served itself well. Now, you asked how long did it take to build it? Uh, once you understand how to use these methodologies and you trust yourself to collect the nodes and Yep. and be kind as you do it, um, you, can, you can do it very quickly. Like we've had uh, client emergency questions where over a period of week we had to take all of this confusing stuff and put it in a sequence that made it not confusing. So if Rise of the Hero didn't took a month, there's also tens of, tens of situations where it took a week. Um, to answer your question about what's on the wall here, when COVID st struck, strike, yeah. <laughs> came, <laughs> hit us, punched us in the face, uh, when it came, I basically like thought to myself, I said, you know, these are, this is going to be fascinating and hard. Uh, I'm, I can't just let my emotions and mind observe. I have to take note. And so I fully converted this extra this guest room because I knew we weren't going to have any guests. Yeah. And I was like, this has got to be a lab. And so I started with like micro noting and then it got to the point where what you see here are hundreds of notes from all kinds of webinars I was in or on or listened to, all kinds of client projects in any category you're thinking of. And then I have a whole unsorted pile sitting next to me. So this is an ongoing process and I'm just waiting to put it to use. And what is the, is there an underlying theme? I mean, obviously COVID is, COVID yes. is here and it's, we, we're seeing it's gonna be here for quite a while, um, but COVID, it, some point will dissipate, but the lessons from it clearly are going to resonate um, for yeah. years. Yeah, well, now. yeah, I, I agree that COVID will dissipate, but not immediately. Sure. And, you know, it's called COVID-19 because it was the virus, coronavirus disease of 2019. So does that mean that there might be a version that is 2020, 2021 and other things that require us to continue the way that we're working and living. So I am, I am ultra conservative on this. I, I shoot long on this. I think we've got months, if not a year, if not more of this being the way. And to your point, you know, some of these things are going to stick. So for example, you know, making a hundred percent of your workforce drive an hour a day to get to your office. Yeah. We all get it. We got that that doesn't make sense anymore. So there's going to be a, permanent titanic shift in how we plan our space. Right. So, you know, that's how we're thinking about brands is like, oh, you used to host your talent in a room. They used to like see your posters and hear your speaking. I'm not gonna see that anymore. Right. So how does your brand show up internally? I do, I, do, I, don't, I, wanna, I didn't wanna miss a question you asked earlier because I thought it was really interesting, which is you asked, once you build the story, once you convey the story, how do you modify the story? And, adapted, yeah, yeah, adapted. And honestly, that's uh, that's the most fun part. Honestly, okay. it's a flexible architecture. So, for example, with Rise of the Hero Gen. Um, okay, so one of the nodes for Rise of the Hero Gen was uh, that we're all because tech. This is again data from five years ago, as it was original, which was that um, technology platforms are enabling people to learn in places where they couldn't access that learning before. Whether that's someone who wants to take an Oxford MBA class remotely or it's someone who wants to learn how to take care of a patient. Um, and those platforms were enabling a whole new revolution in education. So you'd imagine that no matter if I'm talking to a semiconductor company or an aerospace company or a candy bar company, the education references 
the how technology is changing the way that consumers learn and understand their life, all I would use were localized references, localized examples of, of learning as it took place in their categories. Sure. So, sure. yeah, so that's, that's the, the, the adaptability of a framework like this. Mm-hmm. You asked another question, which is, as I'm working on the content behind me, is there a primary, you know, underlying theme? Mm-hmm. And I have not on the record shared that theme with anybody, but if now is the time and place, I'll, I'm happy to try it on you and you can just give me your gut reaction. Yeah, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Um, well, some background first. I, for, I've been running Innovation Protocol for 14 years, and I say running it in an active leadership sense, directly engaged with all of my coworkers on their personal development, their client work. Uh, so I'm not like overseeing a, a team of managers. I'm working directly with people every day to run the business. And um, one of my dear coworkers who I trust and has been a great count of great counsel to me um, kind of came at me a month or so ago because I was running our all coworker, co- you know, call connect and I was a little down, um, okay. you know, as we, as we should be right now. Yeah. It's a difficult and, time. And so uh, the coworker was like, Hey, Hey, chief believer, you know, we're, we, we need you to be talking about what can be. And, um, so I, I've been thinking about it a lot and, um, my notion is strange and it's not going to be comfortable to a lot of people, but where I stand right now and what this is basically helping me conclude, mm-hmm. um, is that, that government does not have the capacity right now to save us. Um, government is going to be in a survival state for probably the next three to five years. And uh, therefore it's only going to be maintaining or surviving uh, whatever transformations and processes. So um, statement one is that, you know, government can't save us. Second thing is that faith for so long did so much to inspire us to to continue when things were hard. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that it's very, very hard to be devoutly faithful when so many things are happening in anti-faith ways, anti-God ways, whatever the creation force is, whatever the driving energy that inspires us to be and to live, um, there's a lot of questioning and discussion happening right now. So not that faith isn't bedrock, it's just, it's not gonna lead this. It's not gonna lead us out of this. Right. So I, you know, I have to ask myself then what is? What is going to lead us out of this? Uh, academia is in midst of a reformation that is going to tear down a lot of it. And okay, so so what is? And my conclusion is business. Okay, business is the only thing with the capacity to save us right now. Business has the inspired talent. Mm-hmm. Business has the tech savvy. Business has the international connectivity and connection and enablement and uh you know business has the morality on on show uh for example with corporate social responsibility black lives matter all you know corporations are like having to be like oh well okay okay all right you know you got it and and we'll think about that and we missed that and oh my gosh i can't believe we didn't Right. You're right. Okay. Well, you know, government and faith and all these guys, they're going to be like, well, so then how? And well, we need a policy. And so to me, the activist front is business. It, it, and the amazing thing about business is you hear about all these nations that, I don't know, hate each other or don't like each other or have like fundamental disagreements. <laughs> to be clear, they still do business. They still yeah. connect and transfer funds and work on projects and build roads. So like, you know, it might be a little sod, but behind the scenes, hands are exchanging. Yeah. And so there's something to be said for, we need a savior right now. And the only group with the motivation and the resource 
his business? So that's, that's very interesting. Um, I agree with um, perhaps the first two points um, in that, you know, I do think government has uh, severe limitations to be able to, to quote unquote fix this. Um, faith to me is, that's just a, that's a huge question mark, especially because there are so many faiths um, to get everybody to unify behind, you know, what is, I'm calling it the three pronged, you know, perfect storm right now, you know, the pandemic led to the economic and the combination of those first two exposed yes. what had already been there, which was social injustice. And so now we have this three pronged, just yeah. incredible affront. Um, and so what is interesting to me, I, and I like this concept, but I feel like business corporate responsibility has been there. I studied it 15 years ago. Yeah. But, but now it's on blast. It. You know, now we have the internet to, to, to give people the feedback channel to give yeah. put tension in play. And that's the difference. I, I, I agree with you. I've always been talking to my clients about corporate social responsibility. But now it is the primary marketing mechanism. It is the yeah. only way I will hear about you. And that's why I think it has new, new opportunity. Sasha, welcome back uh, to the first ever uh, two-parter here. So we ran out of time on our last one. So I'm, uh, I'm happy that you were able to jump back on so we can continue the conversation. I, I enjoyed it. I'm glad we're doing a second one. Okay, so for the viewers, it's gonna be pretty seamless, but we just left off, you just introduced um, and debuted really this new storyboard that you're working on. Um, and so where I wanted to pick up is we're talking about corporate responsibility, um, which is something that has been, you know, you've been promoting it. Um, and so the question that I have really in this new concept is, are corporations chasing consumers or are they leading, or do you think they will be leading consumers in this, in this moment moving forward? I love that question so much. Uh, because corporations are well-organized groups of organisms, I just think that they're gonna have more impact than individual consumers. That's all. I just think that, that by their aggregation abilities alone, their ability to bring resources and talent to the table, that together they're gonna to have, they're gonna be able to push us further or create more change than individual marchers. That's all. Okay. And that's, that's good. And it's interesting. I, I had another guest on who was saying, you know, organizations are simply uh, a composition of individuals. Right. Yeah. And so, um, so then I guess from the, the way to make an impact, do we think that it's the individuals of the organization that make up that embodiment? They're going to kind of be micro leaders within, which will then as a whole turn this organization and this collective business community into that, that tip of the spear. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree that there needs to be individual action inside these organizations. And I believe, and this is how we counsel our clients and in innovation protocol is that there, there deserves to be a space for individual activity and action. But there is also an equally as important collaborative effort where we're all putting our energies together against certain needs, certain social responsibilities, et cetera. Now, I, I love both, and I'm all about the individual and the cohort. But what I'm talking about when I talk about what's going to really affect change is that because business is incentivized by capitalism and creation, et cetera, it's going to keep moving forward and people are going to continue to work and grow their careers and advance their talents, et cetera. And so that's why that cohort model to me is so important right now, given the crisis, um, that, that, that organization, that ability to, to get people to work together and solve common problems. That's where I think business is going to have such an impact on social cause just simply by the organization of its people, that mechanism alone. Okay, well, so then the next question is, what are the questions or what is the question that businesses should be asking themselves right now? So it's a fine line because like when it comes to racial injustice, uh, that's often associated with a political concept, right? And so it's hard for a business to even reference something that's political. It's by nature supposed to be apolitical. So. What I have found to be the most effective is that when you take whatever your core skill set is as an organization, whatever you get paid the most money to do. So let's just say you're a law firm, you have a hundred people, you don't get paid the most to lift heavy boxes, you get paid the most to solve legal challenges. Sure. You take your core mastery, whatever you are the best at, 
Can you find the type of social service organizations that need that have that problem? So that you give legal counsel as your contribution. That to me is where the most impact will be made. And that is actually how an organization should pick what cause they pursue. Don't sort of like, hey, what do we think or what do we feel, et cetera. Get down to brass tacks. What do we do for a living and what do we get paid the most for? Okay, great. What kind of organizations can benefit from that lift? And then go choose the cause. Then go choose the action or the organization. That's my governance. Okay. And so it sounds like from this, I mean, really, there's a lot of organizations that have, and we know this, but they, they kind of have been lost in the shadows. There's a lot of organizations that have been leading these causes that just haven't had the manpower, the, you know, the, the energy behind them. And so this is the great opportunity that, to your point, find what we're good at and go, go align, go, go build an alignment. <laughs> And it'll be good for the individuals inside the organization because they'll be using their core competencies in, an, in another way. In a, and it's the most authentic. When you come knocking on that cause and you say, we're here to help. And they say, great, why are you here to help? And you say, well, I've got 100 people who really want to save the world. It's like, all right, well, thank you. Uh, but when you say, listen, we sell a service for $500 an hour, it is integral to these kinds of organizations and their success. We want you to have it as a homeless shelter. Right. That, that there's, there's just more impact and everyone on the giving and the receiving end can be authentically present and connect with the action. And that's why that's what we believe the, the priority is. That's, that's how you choose where you put your cause action is based on your core competency and the value it can contribute to an organization who, who needs that thing. Sure. Rather than, you know, what you personally as a leader or you socially as a group of people would like to be focused on. Okay, so then the follow-up question to this is, that's the action and that's the behavior that we have an opportunity to engage in. Yeah. Um, where do you guys stand as far as what what should our message be to the consumer or to the marketplace? Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really appreciate the question. You know, you and I as marketers, we've always been thinking about how you engage and inform, engage and inform, and right? Um, but what I also think is super important here is that now that um, so many organizations have been brought to question, so many leaders are under question, so much of our processes in the past have, we realize are sort of out of alignment, that the, the cause behavior now is kind of what all talent, when they're making their employment choice, when they're making their cut cons consumption choice, they used to choose on in the engagement and all the things that you and I do. Now there's an equal as uh, equally as important quotient, which is, oh, and what is the organization doing for the world? Or what is it, what is its workforce doing for the world? So I actually believe that part of the successful go to market strategy of the day is to recognize that even though you might be putting all of this concerted effort into your social campaigns and your LinkedIn messaging and all that sort of stuff, that's necessary, but it's not intriguing. Whereas how you use your best practice to contribute to a cause, that is the kind of thing that piques interest, that people tell their family, hey, I'm thinking about working for this company, they're doing this really interesting thing. And that authentic connection to your core competency makes them realize, well, wow, this is not thematic. This isn't going to change every quarter. This isn't like the cause that we're working for this week. This right. is tied to who we are. And that's what I think is going to help consumers and is already helping employees make choices. They're choosing the organization they work for based on the cause mission, less the compensation. Sure. Okay. Well, and that to me is it, we're breaking down barriers um, and getting to the heart of really what, what matters. And I think, you know, I think it's good because it's what's right. Um, but I also think consumers are demanding it. Um, and one of the vehicles that we're using right now and, and several organizations are using right now is video. Um, and so instantly overnight, we've been forced into, um, into this weird, you know, I'm connected, not quite connected, but, but yet it's, it's almost like we are. Um, that's happening a lot internally. Um, and it's happening these very raw moments. You're in your office, I'm in my office. How should organizations look at video and maintaining kind of this level of authenticity outward as they look at the, the consumer in the marketplace? Yes, so we've been forced into this as you described and I think a lot of us 
uh, were getting by, if you, if I may. You know, we were just kind of like, well, here I am on video. And what I really believe, and what we continue to counsel our clients on, is uh, plan on it being like this for 18 months. Even if there are people gathering and people are allowed back in offices, it's not going to be like it was. So, video will be your channel. And we tell them, we say, if you can't sell remotely, lead remotely, or teach remotely, you're not going to exist in this era. So the video channel forced upon us by circumstances was distracting and frustrating initially, but as you are doing and all of your partners and customers I suspect are doing also, they're realizing like, well, interestingly, this is kind of effective. We're getting more conversation happening. More employees are looking each other in the face for longer. Yeah. Think about a meeting. You know, remember you, you and I would sit around a meeting and there'd be 10 people at the meeting. How many of those 10 people got vocal time in that meeting? Now, you and I might run inviting environments, but needless to say, you know, there was probably two primary speakers. But now that everyone is on mute and we're all locked in this channel, it's completely changing the leadership dialogue. It's completely changing how people are engaging. And so what I look at the, this sort of the culprit of video is that it, it really was shocking and oh my gosh, we were so much about the face-to-face -face before. Shoot, it's unfortunate, we've gotta do it this way, this is weird, you're in my office, I, I'm in yours, it's weird. But wait a minute, this is kind of amazing. You yeah. and I would not have been had, had the chance yeah. to do this before. Right. And we're doing this with our clients and helping them do it with their audiences. And it's like, wow, we all get our own show. We all get our own TV show. And it doesn't matter if only a thousand people watch it, they're our core customer, they love it, they're happy to see it, perfect. And you know, you and I are old enough to remember when there was like, wouldn't it be neat if I had my own radio show, right? Right? Well, that was because we had something to say and the, the broadcast was intriguing. Here now we have exceptional, I mean, high, video, high quality video, good audio, we're lucky. We're lucky to have this as a tool. And so sorry, that's a long answer to your question, but I really look at video as the thing that will bring us together in this untogether state and sure, businesses sure. leveraging it like yours are, are really, um, I don't want to say on the leading edge. I want to say that they're doing the most right thing. That's, that's the action. the most right thing. Sure. I, I think it's interesting podcast. So yes, radio shows, right? You know, I want to be a host. That was definitely one. And then the podcast revolution happened. Um, and that was one, you know, where people were saying like, hey, go start your podcast. And, and it seemed complicated and nuanced and I'm not sure. And the fact that video has been thrust, right? right? Like I can, I can attest you're on a vodcast that started about two and a half months ago where we had no idea what the word vodcast meant. Um, and suddenly, you know, we're talking with people from all over the world yeah. about topics that are interesting and engaging. Um, and it's not as complicated as it seems, but it does give you this opportunity to be incredibly authentic and yeah. raw and people just respond to that in a, yeah. in a way that's, it's almost unimaginable. I love what you're saying. You know, you think about the most successful podcasters um, and they actually are video recording and rebroadcasting their podcasting. It's, it's amazing. Right. That's what drove most of the traffic. So the other thing about podcasting was, um, I think you've probably heard this too, that the uh, average listener sped up the podcast. They listened to them at about one and a half speed which is super interesting that basically yeah. suggests that mm, the only audio dialogue is a little slow. It's a little hard to connect with. Right. Whereas like we're seeing here, we have to be authentic. You know, you know whether or not I'm distracted. Um, I feel you, you feel me that that makes this stick more. And that's why video is so much different. And by the nature of the podcast was, I always associated the podcast, the, the success of podcasts with commuting is that it gave people the time to listen. And we don't have that anymore, and we're not going to have it anytime soon. And so the whole podcast audio-only channel for me doesn't have the chance compared to this. This right. is just so much better. Totally agree. Um, you've touched on something in the past, um, empathy. And I think as we're talking about this vehicle, um, 
Can you just talk us through the importance of empathy? Because as we're looking out, you know, maybe I am going to be talking to a consumer um, or maybe I'm going to be talking to a group of consumers, but um, everybody's going through a lot right now. So empathy was important before and it's oh, incredibly important now. I can't even say, yes, thank you for re restating that. And I'll tell you, since you and I uh, connected last time and, and had our initial conversation, I've had many classes with my graduate students since, and um, I'm sort of a, an, emo, <laughs> an emo professor anyway. So I started my latest class with a poll. It was a three and a half hour class. So, you know, we have to get our heads in the right place. And I started it with a Zoom poll where I asked people one of five questions. I said, excuse me, it was, you had to pick one of five. And the thing was, uh, how, question was, how are you doing? The first answer was, okay, all things, sorry, good, all things considered. Okay, all things considered. Neutral. Um, a, little, a little impacted. And then the last one was heavily weighted. Weighted like, uh. yeah. And it was interesting because 20% of the students in, in this anonymous poll actually chose weighted. They chose the low. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. It, yeah. So, you talk about it, uh, empathy. So, normally when you think about class, you're like, all right, everybody, here's our three hours. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. And then I start the class with a poll and realize that 20% of the class is in emotional distress. Right. And that informed the next three hours. The way that other classmates asked questions, the way that I introduced a topic or a break considered the emotional state of the audience that I was trying to serve. And of course, as you might suspect, that was, that was what was needed. The students made comments after the fact. And in fact, the students who rated doing great were like, I'm so glad you helped me understand that there were some classmates that weren't doing great. Sure, and yeah. so that, that empathy consideration just makes the information stick better. So you and I as marketers, our goal is to make things sticky. And I, I just firmly believe that there, is, there aren't a lot of empathy channels right now. There's a lot of complaining channels, but hearing you, feeling you and responding to you, that isn't happening. And that's where I wanna make it. It's on my sort of personal mission, mission agenda to really drive that understanding. When you and I were together last time, I sort of referenced the notion that in public speaking, that like anybody comes up to a public speaker and says, hey, like I wanna be a speaker like you, what's the number one thing I should know? And every one of us will say the exact same thing, which is know thy audience. Just don't even write a speech until you understand the psyche of the audience you're trying to engage and hear to your question, empathy is that ticket and we need it more than ever now. Well, so I like what you did with your class because I think, you know, that is the, the grounding principle, which is, you know, know your audience, right? You, you shouldn't know what you're talking about until you know the audience in front of you. Um, but what I feel like is missed is the fact that we, while we may understand our audience right now, we may not fully understand the depth of what's what's happening. And so mm -hmm. what I love that you did is you started off with the poll. And I think that's a great opportunity for businesses today to actually reach out and poll, survey, talk to them, you know, have one-on-ones, of course, but like put it out there so you really have a pulse on what is going on within your market right now. And the best part is that you can show them back the data and you don't have to solve for anything. You could just, right. and that's what I basically did at the classes. I pushed up the poll results and I said to everybody, wow, what, what do you think about this? And, and it just, again, it changes the dialogue. It makes, it makes the conversation um, abs more absorbable, more, more, more connectable um, because it's really about how people are feeling. And you know, the old adage is, they will never remember what you say. They will only remember how you made them feel. Right. And if you made them feel considered, then they'll probably buy from you. <laughs> they probably will come back and buy from you. Well, and you have an opportunity to serve them better, right? Which is, it, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling cycle. Um, because at the end of the day, we went into business to solve some sort of problem or to fill a gap. Um, and the reality is that gap consistently changes over time. And if you're not keeping your pulse on it, then you're missing the opportunity to maintain that relationship. Well, you think about you, your career, my career, where we really have been senior client partners. You know, it's what we've done. You, we do a lot of other things, team leadership, et cetera, but we're the senior client partners friend. Uh, and, and you think about how you and I might start a conversation with a very senior customer. 
the conversation always is, hey, so how are you? Right. How, right? How's this? How's that? How's this neighborhood? How's that project? And we you know that was always like written up as like the secret to selling. And the fact of the matter is, is that that's because that what was that was what was needed. That's what that's that's exactly the human experience that needs to be had is a emotional check in first, and then we can solve or build or advance whatever the case is. And so it's just interesting that it took a worldwide crisis to slap all businesses across the face and be like, just hold up a second before you, you know, encroach on my inbox trying to sell me something. Just, you know, first consider that I'm in an uncomfortable state, you know? And so I don't think you and I have started a new business call in the last four months without starting it like, so, hey, you know, is now, is now even still a good time? And, and is there something else you want to talk about? We can cover this later, you know? Um, and that, that access, that, that accessibility, that emotional vulnerability is what builds ties that bind, that get people to be connected to us where call three, they're asking us, can you please sell to me? Right. Yeah, and I think it's it's missed because we we are prone to label things, right? I'm in B to C, I'm in B to B. I just had a an interview with a, a headhunting firm in Canada, um, Pronexia, and they believe it's H to H, so human to human, yeah. um, and and so this is where that resonates um, perfectly. Um, I have yeah. a question about you. Um, to me, you're somebody that I personally, you're, you're inspiring, you're motivating. Um, and so you're somebody that I look to, you know, when I'm, I'm struggling, who do you look to? Is there a podcast? Is there a book that is kind of your go-to as far as like, Hey, I need to pick me up or I'm, you know, I've been staying at the, the white piece of paper for too long and I don't know what's next. Um, where do you turn to? Well, first, I appreciate that you feel like I'm adding something, energe- some energy or insight. I appreciate that. So you're asking me what charges me. Um, I have two answers. I, and I'll tell you the third, the third factor first before I tell you the two answers. Um, when, I was, when I started my, this business, Innovation Protocol, 14 years ago, I actually went on a hunt to find a mentor. Uh, someone to be my counsel. After a year and a half of one-to-one interviews with many options, I quickly realized that isn't fair of me. It isn't fair of me to ask a single individual to be my source. And so I joined uh, entrepreneur societies and other business leader groups, and I found a cohort. I found a group. So my answer to your question is that I never turn to a single source. I am always seeking multiple channels of influence so that I never put the burden on a single, you know, resource. So part of what keeps me up is that I am not dependent on one blog blogger or one speaker. Um, just two, but to the two answers to your question, um, I like to use, uh, music as my inspiration. And I happen to listen to music that is high energy and fast and things. I'm Southern California raised, so punk rock is in my blood. And I've been to thousands, literally thousands of punk rock concerts. And I still listen to music every single day. I make myself listen. And what I find inspiring is that those artists are still creating. I don't know if you've looked through your music catalog lately, but if you have any apps like Spotify or Tidal, uh, there is so much music coming out right now. Artists are like, oh my God, I've got something to say, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, dude, if you can keep creating, like artists, you've been creating music for 30 years and you're still creating, well, then I, then I can pull my pants up and have a good day, you know? Right. So right. that's one of my conduits for inspiration is to look to artists, look to musicians, to see them creating. And that says to me that I also have the duty to create. But the other resource that I turn to are people who are dead. Um, I turn to, yeah, well, it helps me because I don't have to worry about whether I think that they're being nice, nice to their kids right now. I can only look back at what they thought of 50 years ago or 100 years ago, and I'll end by simply saying, people who studied wisdom traditions, religions, com- communities, what brought people together, what doctrine brought them together, those people, those auditors of wisdom traditions, they continue to inspire me. They're my books. They're who I turn to when I'm trying to reconcile my frustration with humanity. So uh, cohort to keep inspired, but two quick answers, folks that I don't have to 
judge in contemporary terms yeah. and then artists that continue to create and inspire me. Good advice. I go to music quite a bit. Um, and what I do love is there is bountiful supply of it. And depending on your mood, you can find something that fits. Um, and so for me, a lot of times I want calming, right? So I'm, I'm kind of the opposite of you. Um, so I'm looking for the, hey, I want to bring me down just so I can find that sweet spot. Um, but no matter what, you can find something to fit, fit what you're looking for. That, yeah, and I, that maybe would be a, another answer to your question. When I'm not trying to be inspired and I'm not trying to create, I absolutely also turn to music to chill me down. You know, there's a band called Explosions in the Sky, which is so talented. I, I can't even, I don't even have the right to say their name. They're so incredible at what they do, and they've been doing it for decades. Um, nothing has soothed me or my children more than their craft, and that that also is a reminder that if they can continue to create, continue to do what they do best now, then so should I, so should I. Okay, well, last question here. Um, younger you, just starting your career, um, what advice do you have, uh, have the youngster um, after all these years that you've, you've kind of been through trials and tribulations? Um, this is super personal, but here we go. So. I live, I was sort of puritanical, and I mean that explicitly uh, in my earlier career. I, I'll, the answer to your question is that I would be less judgmental of leadership. Yeah. I would be more forgiving. Uh, I would give them more permissions to make mistakes or under deliver or not know the answer. And when I was in my early 20s and I was, the highest revenue producing person in the global firm. And I was flying everywhere every day, you know, my, and I would turn to the leadership and, and they didn't have the answer I was looking for. I was like, well, you just moved down on my life, you know, you right. And now I'm 14 years into running a workforce of 25 people. And, and gosh, I wish they gave me forgiveness um, and they do. And I appreciate it when they do. So my counsel back to myself would be everyone is just, making it. They're just trying to make their way every day. And you've got to give them that space to not, to not know or to be imperfect or to make a bad decision. And that doesn't have the right, that situation doesn't have the right to completely reframe your, your view of them. So a little forgiveness for leadership would be, of my, be my counsel to myself early. Okay. Well, sage advice for everybody right now. So, um, well, I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, I look forward to having you again. And uh, even more so, I look forward to seeing the finished uh, product of, uh, of what is displayed behind you. I appreciate that so much, Joshua. It's a pleasure to connect on this level. If you're looking for other folks to speak with, um, there's, there's a lot of folks that I would recommend, but uh, you're doing great work. And I'm glad that you're finding this channel useful to you. Uh, you're good at this, so keep Thank it you. up. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the next interview you have. Thank you very much. Cool.